Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Richard Mendelson, and I am faculty in Kaiser University's Graduate School in Psychology Department. Uh, my specialization is Industrial and Organizational Psychology. Today I'm here to speak with you about stress and emotion. So, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what is stress? Stress is the pressure or strain that a person experiences as a result of changes and demands of one's environment. Now this can come in many shapes or forms. Uh, stress can occur because a person experiences some kind of changes within their family circumstances, within their financial circumstances. Um, it could also be the environment itself. Uh, for example, if you wake up in the morning and you dress for a very nice, beautiful, sunny day, and by that afternoon it's pouring rain and you find yourself unprepared, it's likely that you will experience some degree of or level of stress as a result of the change in the environment in which you are existing at that time. Now, we experience stress for several reasons. First of all, uh, things like frustration, uh, anxiety, or even conflict can cause an individual to experience a stress response on an emotional and on a physiological level. So change, even if it's a positive thing, even if it's something we want to do, uh, can also lead to stress because you're going to experience physiological responses to the changes in your environment. Uh, for example, starting a new job, enrolling in a new uh, university or graduate school program. These are all very positive experiences for people, but they are often accompanied by the same physiological responses that a person would experience if and when they are embarking on something that could be a dangerous situation for them. Uh, perhaps before they quit a job or perhaps before they, you know, initiate a new relationship or something like that. So whether it's positive or negative uh, in terms of the situation or scenario a person finds him or herself in, uh, it's still normal to experience a stress response, that physiological response to stress. So even if you have something that begins with positive outcomes in mind, make sure that you realize you can still have the same physiological responses of stress that you would if and when you were to embark on a situation that might not be positive. What types of stress exist? Okay, so in life, we're going to experience both positive stressors and negative stressors, okay? The positive stressors, uh, they cause you to experience what is called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E -S. Now, eustress, this is a positive stressor. It keeps an individual moving forward and making progress towards some type of a positive goal. Uh, for example, training to run a marathon or, you know, working to better your health uh, by losing weight, something like that, uh, you're likely to experience a stress response, but that would be a result of you stress, positive stress, things like meeting new people, uh, completing a task or something like that for work. These are all very positive things. Now, on the other side of the spectrum of what stress is, is distress distress is negative stress. It's stress that it can uh, prevent you from reaching goals. It can inhibit your ability to, uh, to make you know, good decisions uh, in situations that are a result of you know, conflict of some sort. And your inability to make good decisions can then lead to additional confusion, additional conflict and anxiety which are all causes of negative stress. So, when it comes to how we deal with stress, it's important that we realize uh, stress is a very natural thing. And in nature, all animals experience stressors. There are really only two possible responses. When we face stress head on, we choose to either fight through it or to flight, meaning run away from it, avoid the stress as much as we possibly can. If we choose to fight that stress, meaning we stay and we face the stressor, 
we find a way to work through it. Um, fighting stress, uh, what we're really looking at, it means the person is choosing to confront the stressor and find a way to generate the most positive outcome possible. If you opt to fight, there are one or two out, one of two possible outcomes. You either succeed or you fail. That's the only potential outcome from a choice to remain engaged and to fight through any type of a stressor. The other action is flight. As I mentioned, that means to try your hardest to avoid stress at all costs. Um, should you choose to flee, flight, uh, then you're really choosing not to make any decision or to take any action towards resolving the issue that's causing stress. Instead, you are avoiding it, you are running away from it, you're doing the best you can not to engage, not to have any type of interaction. Uh, now, this can be positive at times in terms of you can avoid issues, uh, but typically, over time, you will at some point have to address whatever the issue is. So, in truth, when you choose flight, it shouldn't be because you think you're going to avoid an issue entirely. It should be because you feel like, given the opportunity, you might be better prepared to address the issue at a later date or time. Physiologically, our body is very interesting in its response to stress experiences. Uh, when a person experiences stress, more often than not, they will experience what's called an adrenaline dump. Now, the adrenal system in our body, it's uh, really fueled by two small glands that are located just above the kidneys on each side of your body. Uh, these are called adrenal glands. Now, the adrenal gland produces a chemical substance known as adrenaline. Now, when your body experiences stress, your adrenal glands go into overdrive and they dump adrenaline into your system. And it flows through your bloodstream and it results in some very specific, probably very familiar uh, physiological responses to stress. Things such as sweaty palms, your hands, um, increasing heart rate, and breathing faster and more shallow, increased respiration. Sometimes you may get a shaky or jittery feeling. Uh, in addition, you're likely to, pay, to have what's called increased attentional processes or hyperacuity. Um, you become more in tune with things in your environment. Uh, you tend to be more cognizant of the things that you are sensing, things you see, hear, taste, smell and touch. So these are all normal and natural responses to adrenaline being dumped into your system. General adaptation syndrome or gas, it's the entire cycle of what your body experiences as a result of adrenaline, as a result of stressors. So the first stage, you experience that sense of alarm and when you experience that sense of alarm, your stress level starts to increase. When your stress increases, your body, believe it or not, which wants to remain at a constant state of balance or equilibrium, is going to do its best to keep itself level, right? So as you begin to have the adrenaline dump into your system, your body is fighting against that, trying to return to its normal state of equilibrium, and that is stage two of general adaptation syndrome, which is called resistance. Now, once your body wins that battle, once your body begins to calm itself down, once the adrenaline rush subsides, once you get back to that state where you are able to be calm, it is very common and very normal that a person will report feeling exhausted, physically, emotionally exhausted. Oftentimes it's followed up by people wanting to go to sleep or find a way to relax or de-stress. Um, this is a normal part of your system. Uh, if you think of it in terms of a, a pendulum, if you were to take a ball on a, on a string and swing it, it will swing equidistant in both directions 
and over time it will swing a little bit less in each direction until that energy dissipates and it returns to dead center which would be that level of equilibrium right so if stress causes your body to swing very very far towards one side your body is going to fight just as hard to bring it back to an equal level on the other side it ends up overshooting that that middle point that equilibrium and it brings it all the way across to the opposite side it takes a while for your body to process through the chemicals that have been dumped into its system by your adrenal gland and then reach that state of equilibrium again now in life we're going to experience conflict it's something that's unavoidable it doesn't matter if you try and flee conflict at every opportunity ultimately we are going to experience some form of conflict at some point in our lives but there are different types of conflict for example we have approach approach conflict approach approach conflict is a very positive type of conflict the reason why is that each possible outcome each opportunity for you to make a decision going one way or the other it's only going to yield very positive outcomes for example you sit down tonight at dinner with your family and you decided that you're going to go on a family vacation together and this is a wonderful and exciting thing everybody likes to have time to spend with their loved ones and de-stress and you're very excited about vacation but an approach approach conflict presents itself when you cannot decide between two different places that you would all like to go there are benefits and positives to going to each of those places and there are no negatives associated with going to either of those places so either choice you make either way you decide you're going to have a very positive experience this is what an approach approach conflict looks like either choice is positive and there's nothing negative that should influence the way you decide uh, in terms of the choice you have to make. Now slightly different from the approach-approach conflict is the approach-avoidance conflict. The approach-avoidance conflict is typically pretty easy for people to make decisions during. The reason why is that one choice is overwhelmingly positive, okay, very positive decision. The other choice there's a risk of negative outcome to it as well. So for example, you choose to go to uh, your employer and you ask for a raise. The positive side of that is if your employer agrees with you, you could end up getting a raise. That would be fantastic. But the potential negative of that choice is that your employer may respond in a negative fashion and decide not only are you not getting a raise, but they can get somebody to do your same job for less money so they no longer need your services so with this in mind you make a conscious decision in an approach avoidance conflict you have a possible positive outcome and a possible negative outcome in that scenario when you're faced with an approach avoidance conflict do you choose to fight and go for it do you choose to approach your employer do you choose to say to your employer, I've been here for X number of years, the service I provide is wonderful, I feel like I, you know, deserve a raise? Or do you choose not to have that conversation at all? Do you choose to sit back and allow your employer to continue paying you the same wages, even though you believe in your brain and in your heart that you are worth more? Very difficult decision to make. Uh, when you face an approach avoidance conflict. Oftentimes these are challenging uh, because people realize that not only is there a lot to gain but potentially there's a lot to lose through working through an approach avoidance conflict. Okay, avoidance avoidance conflict. This is our third type of conflict. Now an avoidance avoidance conflict is widely regarded as the worst type of conflict. The reason why? Both possible outcomes are negative. There is no good answer. Um, for example, if you were to go and visit the doctor, you're going to have to have blood drawn. 
most people don't like having blood drawn. That's a negative outcome. But if you choose not to visit the doctor, you may have very negative health outcomes in the future. For example, there may be some type of easily detectable issue that you are experiencing that you don't know about, but by the time it's detected down the road, it's too late to treat it because you opted not to go to the doctor. So, both possible choices, both possible outcomes are negative. Uh, unfortunately, during an avoidance-avoidance conflict, the challenge really seems to be picking the decision that is what we call the lesser of the two evils, meaning which possible decision is going to yield the lowest net gain of unhappiness. And that's a challenging decision to make in many circumstances. <clears throat> Finally, we have what are known as double approach avoidance conflicts. This is the most common type of conflict that people experience. Every possible outcome has both positive and negative outcomes. Uh, we experience these at all different stages of life as well, from childhood through adulthood. Uh, one example of this would be switching to a new job. You may switch to a new job and have an increase in the amount of money you're earning, but you also may feel less secure in your position. Why? Well, because you're the new person in that position, you're the new person in that organization. You could choose to remain in the position you currently have. You'll have increased uh, feelings of security, meaning you feel good that you're going to constantly have a job, but you may feel less fulfilled or you may feel undervalued. And these are decisions that people have to make all the time uh, in terms of whether they're going to decide to choose choice A because it has higher potential positives or perhaps choosing choice B because although the positives aren't as good, it has a lower risk of negative outcomes. So we have to weigh positives and negatives when we're dealing with double approach avoidance conflict. And in each individual set of circumstances, we have to look for mainly two things. What is going to yield the highest positive outcome and the lowest negative outcome? The challenge comes when one decision has the, uh, the highest positive outcome potential, but a different choice has the lowest negative outcome potential. So at that point, again, we return to that debate or question of, are we going to choose fight or are we going to choose flight? Are we going to choose to take a risk uh, in order to try and seek some sort of reward or positive outcome? Or are we going to avoid taking that risk in order to assure ourselves of the lowest negative possible outcome? And these are decisions that human beings have to make on a regular basis. Uh, the challenge is when it comes to decision making, not everyone is a good decision maker. Some people lack the ability to weigh the positives and negatives uh, when dealing with things like a double approach avoidance type of a conflict. And as a result of that, poor choices and poor decisions are made, which can lead to outcomes that are less than desirable for the individual who's making those decisions. So, coping with stress. Coping with stress is, is something that people have to do. Um, there are people who take actions to cope with stress. Some of them are very positive. Uh, people channel their stress energy into doing things like working out or uh, meditating or even creating some form of art, whether it be music or painting or sculpting or, or something like that. Um, but there are also negative ways that people cope with stress. Um, when stress hits a person and they cope negatively, uh, it, the person allows the stress to drive them towards very negative things. Things like drinking more alcohol or increasing how much they use tobacco products or illicit drugs. Um, when stress negatively impacts a person in this manner, uh, the negative fallout of that experience can last a lot longer than the initial stressor. Uh, by the time a person works through the issue that was causing the stress, they may now have new issues, uh, things like addiction to substances or negative health impacts that are a result of things like 
you know, smoking more, drinking more, eating too much, not exercising enough, um, doing things like that have a longer lasting effect and impact on your body oftentimes than the original stressor does. So it's recommended that people work towards channeling their stress or their stress experience in a positive way. And in doing that, you're performing an action called sublimation. Uh, when you sublimate, you are taking that negative stressor and you're driving it to allow you or, or to drive you to do something that's more positive. Um, again, it could be something like exercise. Uh, sometimes after a particularly stressful day, people enjoy going for a run or exercising in the gym or creating music or cooking a nice healthy meal, whatever the case may be. If we are conscious of the fact that we are experiencing stress, it is much more likely that we will uh, more appropriately work through that stress in a positive way. That brings us to the concept of emotion. Now emotion is something that I spend a great deal of time studying as one of my areas of research expertise is emotional intelligence. Um, when it comes to people's general understanding of emotion, uh, frankly a lot of people kind of fall short. They're familiar with and understand that we experience emotional things, but we do not necessarily understand where those emotions originate, why we experience them, how we interpret them, and how we respond to them. And those are the things that I'm going to work through with you today during the rest of this lesson. So in order to move forward like that, first thing we need to do is present a concrete operational definition of what emotion is. So with that in mind, an emotion is a feeling or state that is characterized by a physiological arousal, cognitive interpretation of stimuli, and expressive behaviors. So what does that mean? It means there's three components to emotion. The physiological component is understanding that when you experience a stimulus or a stimuli, meaning you see something or you smell something or you taste something, you feel something, you hear something, anytime we experience a stimulus from the surroundings in our environment, our first response is oftentimes emotional. The physiological component means it leads us to feel a certain way. Uh, I mentioned earlier that sometimes a, a stressor can cause you to have physiological responses like sweaty palms, elevated heart rate, increased respiration, hyperventilation, things like that. Um, and it absolutely can. But the challenging thing to understand is that all of those emotions are normal if a person experiences something, for example, that makes them afraid. If you're afraid, it's very normal that you're going to have that adrenaline dump and you're going to experience all of those physiological things, right? But what the challenge is, is to understand and recognize that excitement, in a positive excitement, can lead to the very same physiological responses. And think about the first time that you know you you went to a, a new school and you had all the potential of meeting new friends or you know when when you found out that you got the job you really wanted or you found out that you were going to have the opportunity to go to college it's very normal that those experiences will also lead to an adrenaline dump and lead you to experience the same physiological changes that a negative stimulus that causes something like fear can help you can cause you to have so that's the physiological component in and of itself physiological responses are not enough to help you understand what emotion you are feeling at any moment there's also the expressive component what that means is how do we show the way we feel on an outward level how do we outwardly emote so Think of it like this. Um, if someone had ever made you feel threatened and you were afraid, it's a very normal emotional response, fear. You're going to have the same physiological responses, the sweaty palms, the increased heart rate, elevated respiration, as a person is likely to have when they find the person 
with whom they're they're going they're falling in love. When a person falls in love, it's it's also normal that you're going to experience the same physiological things as you would when you have a fear response. So how do we differentiate between whether we're afraid, whether it's a negative experience causing this this physiological response, or whether we're in love, or whether we're excited, or whether we're experiencing a very a very positive emotional experience. Well, we differentiate through what's called the cognitive component. It's the way we, in our brain, the way we frame the experience that we're having. And that's going to shape our response. So, for example, let's say that a fear response and a, uh, you know, a love arousal type response are likely to lead to some of the very same physiological things. Uh, I think it's safe to say that in all likelihood, if a person made you feel like you were afraid physically, you probably wouldn't reach out to hold that person's hand. You probably wouldn't show affection towards that person the same way you might if you had the same physiological responses but those responses were caused by that positive experience of meeting a person with whom you're falling in, you're falling in love. So the way that we process the stimuli, the way that we frame in our brain what type of experience this is, whether it's a positive or a negative experience, is going to absolutely and profoundly impact the way that we express outwardly our response to this emotional experience. So, as you can see right below me, there's a chart that explains physiological responses or physiological processes, uh, expressive behavior, and cognitive appraisal. They all interact with one another, but emotion cannot exist without all three of them contributing to our understanding of any experience. Again, physiological component of emotion. You see beneath me a picture of a baby who looks like they're, they're crying and right next to that you see the same baby who looks like they're very happy. How is that kid, how is that baby uh, interpreting the events or the stimuli around him? Well, James Lang was a very important person in emotional theory. Uh, he believed emotions were the result of your physiological arousal. For example, his work involved doing things like have a person who's otherwise not you know, experiencing a happiness emotion, have that person smile and then wait and see if that physiological and behavioral stimulus leads to the person feeling happy. Meaning, it, it comes back, there's the old question of what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, James Lang challenged that if you smile first, you will then feel happiness. Whereas other people believed you smile because you feel happy. So the happy experience caused the smile. James Lang went the opposite direction and he said, no, the smile that you're, that you're forming with your face, that's causing you to feel happiness. He went on and said this is constant with other emotions. If you feel sad, it's because you are crying as opposed to you are crying because you feel sad. So with James Lang's uh, theory, the, the outward response to the stimuli came prior to or before the perception of the emotional experience that a person is having. Ken and Bard also put forth a, a different theory um, that the emotional experiences people have they originate in the thalamus inside the brain. And that's what you see a picture of, uh, you know, behind the words here. Um, the part in, in red is the thalamus. Now the thalamus, it essentially serves as the post office of the brain, if you will. Um, all of our sensory organs, our eyes, our ears, our tongue, our nose, um, our skin, uh, everything that allows us to sense and observe our environment sends messages directly to the thalamus and the brain. The thalamus then processes what organ sent the message and then it sends it to the appropriate area of the brain for interpretation. Then that area of the brain 
sends a message back and it filters down to the body telling us how we should respond to the stimuli around us. So Canon Bard believes that the physiological responses and the emotional experience we have, they occur completely in unison, but they're independent of one another. A person can smile without being happy, a person can be happy without smiling, a person can cry without being sad, and a person can be sad without feeling the need to cry. Each of these aspects of the emotional experience, meaning the experience and the physiological response to the experience or, or to the stimuli, these occur independently and your brain controls them both. Okay, emotion and recognition of emotional states. Now, this is a pretty interesting thing. Um, across the board, we, we've asked questions through research, how well do people recognize emotion based on facial expressions of others? Universally, happiness seems to be the most easily recognizable emotion. Over 80% of people are able to recognize happiness in others based on facial expressions regardless of a person's culture, their ethnicity, or anything like that. Sadness and surprise, they're both relatively easily recognized approximately 67% of the time. Anger, not, not quite as easy to recognize as, uh, as sadness and surprise, more like 63, 64% of the time, people are able to recognize anger in other people. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, being able to recognize anger in other people uh, leads us to, frankly, to keeping ourselves uh, more safe because when people are angry, they sometimes lash out in, in negative ways. So improving our ability to recognize anger across cultures, ethnicities, and within our own peer group uh, is going to lead to higher levels of safety as well as higher levels of happiness. Fear is the most difficult emotion to be able to recognize in a human being. Uh, we are probably about 58% accurate when we assess whether or not someone is experiencing fear based solely on facial expressions and the feeling of disgust is a little bit more easy to recognize than fear but less easy to recognize than the others uh, coming in at about 61%. The Cognitive Component of Emotion Schachter put forth a two-factor theory of emotion. Uh, Schachter believed physiological arousal occurs, meaning you have all the physiological responses to stimuli. Then your cognitive processes occur in order to frame that stimuli, right? Then your brain takes the physiological experience as well as your cognitive experience and creates a singular vision or understanding of what the emotional experience you're having is. Physiological arousal and cognitive interpretation, they happen at the same time, but both of them happen independently and they contribute to your brain in terms of its understanding of any emotional experience you are having. Okay, so when it comes to trying to figure out what an emotional experience is, there are what we call the dimensions of appraisal. Now the dimensions of appraisal, they're things that we don't necessarily have to think through on a conscious level, but we do work through these, uh, these at least on a subconscious level to help us frame and understand the experience we're having. So when we have any type of an experience, one of the first things we think about is pleasantness. Is this experience something that I like? Am I enjoying this? Am I having a good time? Uh, and it's normal that there can be confusion at times uh, because sometimes we're having a new experience that we're uncertain of, meaning we, we don't necessarily know what to expect. So there may be some anxiety, there may be some stress, there may be some apprehension about having this experience at all, but it's still viewed as a positive experience. Um, you know, think about maybe uh, the first time you got to drive a car. 
it's normal that before driving a car, you're going to feel nervous. You're going to have some degree of anxiety, perhaps elevated levels of stress, and maybe even an adrenaline dump. But most of us also become comfortable driving cars eventually, and we view it as a very positive thing for us because it allows us to have a degree of freedom that we didn't have previously. So in that regard, the level of pleasantness we're experiencing is probably going to be relatively high because it's an enjoyable experience to be able to drive for the first time. The next dimension of appraisal is attentional processes, meaning how deeply are we engaged or focused on the event that we're experiencing. So think of it this way. Right now, this video is playing for you in class and you're expected to learn the information that's being presented, but how many of you are completely focused on the lesson? In some classrooms, you may have people who are texting each other on their cell phones, checking email, working on homework. Other times you're going to have people who are very engaged, who are paying very close attention to the lesson at hand. And if and when that happens, uh, it would be safe to say that the attentional processes are at a much higher level, right? They're much higher up than in a classroom where people are texting one another or checking emails or you know otherwise disengaged. The more engaged people are, the higher the level of attentional processes that are being focused on the, the stimuli that you're experiencing. And what about agency? Agency refers to whether or not a person feels like they're in control. So for example, if a person has chosen to enroll in college and they're choosing to invest their time and their effort and their money and their energy into earning a degree, it is likely that that person will demonstrate a higher level of agency than a person who perhaps didn't want to attend college but had no choice but to attend because of their family pressure or you know some other factor in their life. The more that a person believes they are in control of a situation, the more likely it is that it will be viewed in a positive light. A person will view it as if it's a positive experience if they believe they are able to control the situation that they are in. <clears throat> Finally, certainty is very important when we uh, examine the way we respond to stimuli and the way they make us feel. How clear is the situation we are in? Is the outcome predictable? So think for example of um, there's a social experience that people have. They go out and they do these things called escape rooms. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of an escape room, but essentially you get together with a group of friends and they put you into a room and you have to solve some sort of mystery in order to be able to open the door and leave the room at the end of the experience and win. If you were in that situation where you found yourself locked in a room but you hadn't gone there willingly, you didn't know what the expectations were, and you don't know what's going to happen, well, your degree of certainty will be pretty low. If you willingly go to an escape room to spend time with friends and have an exciting experience, well, you probably feel that you're in control of that situation. It's something you've chosen to do of your own volition. But if you woke up in a room like that and had no idea what the situation was that you were in, the situation is unclear, the outcome is not predictable, and you don't feel that you are in control, well, you're more likely to frame that same experience in a very negative way. If you walk into that situation willingly, you could have a really good time with really good friends. So the level of pleasantness is likely to be pretty high. But again, if you find yourself in that situation and you're not comfortable with it, and you're unclear of uh, exactly what it is that you're doing, then you could view this as a very negative and unpleasant experience. But it's, it's the same exact stimuli. What's differing here is that in your dimensions of appraisal, the way your brain is processing this, you recognize the difference between doing something willingly of your own volition or being forced into a situation or scenario in which you're not necessarily comfortable. 
and that is the challenge with dimensions of appraisal is understanding not just the experience itself not just what the stimuli are not just what physiology is happening that you're experiencing internally in your own body but it's experiencing it's understanding the context within which you are having this experience that leads us to the expressive component or Russell's circumplex model. So, we do know that the experience of emotions is cross-cultural. It doesn't matter where you go on earth, every single culture, every person will have the capacity to experience things like happiness, sadness, boredom, arousal, fear, anger, joy, disgust, and surprise. These are universal. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are a person who is living in a major urban area. It doesn't matter if you are in the United States, if you are in South America, if you are in Asia, if you are in Europe. Every person, unless they have a, some sort of a disability or something like that, every person has the experience. Well, every person has the ability to experience these emotions. The difference is not every person, depending on different types of disabilities or conditions, has the ability to outwardly express their emotions in the same way. So the internal aspect of experiencing emotion is universal. The outward ability to emote can be influenced by culture, by geography, by disability, by things like that. At this point, there is no empirical evidence that indicates male and female people experience emotions differently. Now note, I said we do not experience, meaning internally, experience emotions differently than one another. However, depending on where you are, depending on your culture, depending on the norms and mores, uh, outward expression of those emotions can be quite different across cultures emotional expression does differ between male and female people uh, it's influenced by those cultural norms and mores um, just to give you some examples uh, there was a time period in North America uh, the United States most Western civilizations where uh, as young boys um, men were taught you, you don't cry you don't show emotion outwardly you don't uh, allow your emotions to rule you or, or govern your actions whereas over time that has changed considerably and right now um, people are much more comfortable outwardly expressing emotion even if they're a man whereas before something like that would have been frowned upon now it's just part of everyday life um, in addition many many years ago uh, the perception was that females were overly emotional but that is not the case and these days males and females are not looked at any differently in terms of the expectations of the way they not only experience emotion internally but the way they demonstrate or display or outwardly communicate that emotion to others all right we have come to the end of the stress and emotion presentation. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to view it. I hope that you found it interesting, and I hope that each of you is able to take away something positive from the experience and walk away with new knowledge that you didn't possess before. Thank you very much for spending time with me today. Have a great day, everyone.